Buonasera a tutti, Bruchim Abaim, le Kulchem, Bim Yuchad, mi Shehigia, Eleno, um, Yerushalayim, Israel. A very, very cordial welcome to all of you tonight to the Gregorian University to be present at the 13th Brenningmeyer Wehrhain lecture delivered by Professor Israel Yuval with the title. Did Rabbinic Judaism emerge out of Christianity? I'm Father Philip Rentsches, director of the Cardinal Bea Center, the Center for Judaic Studies at this university, which in partnership with the Center for the Study of Christianity at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem is organizing tonight's event. At this point, I would like to give the floor to Father François Xavier Dumortier, Rector Magnificus of this Pontifical University. Thank you, Philip. Excellencies, dear Mrs. Brenningmeyer, dear Mr. Martin Brenningmeyer, dear Mrs. Beaton Ashkeloni, uh, dear Professor Israel Yuval, dear friends. <coughs> the annual Brenningmeyer Verne Lecture is always a wonderful and significant event in our academic and intellectual life at the Pontifical Gregorian University. It's not only an annual event, it's part of a tradition, since this lecture will be the 13th. And such a tradition is also a commitment to go forward on the way of mutual understanding, mutual trust and friendship between us as Jews and Christians as the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and our university. Our Pope Francis has already taken several opportunities to emphasize very strongly how much the Jewish-Christian relationship is really crucial. I may say that we are eager to develop, deepen, and strengthen our own involvement in such relationship as the Santa Bea is already striving to do under the inspired, inspired guidance of Father Ranches. If there is such a fine tradition of conferences by outstanding scholars, it's thanks to your support, Mrs. Benning Meyer. It's certainly always a privilege to have you with us. Unfortunately, your husband is not with us tonight, but all of us are thinking of him this evening. But it's also a great opportunity to thank you deeply for your support and your generous funding, as well as your friendly closeness to what we are trying to do year after year with a long-term perspective. I would like finally to welcome you, Professor Israel Yuval. Your presence is a great honor for us, and thanks to your participation this year, our relationships with the Hebrew University of Jerusalem reveal once again how important these relationships are for the present time and for the future. Many thanks to all of you for your presence. I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you. before such a distinguished audience like you are, I would not want to let slip away the opportunity to update you on two significant views regarding the life of the Cardinal Bear Center. First, on April 16th of this year, the Directive Council of the University approved the new regolamento, the new regulation for the Cardinal Bear Center, approving thereby the center's objectives and academic program which from this academic year onwards enables registered students to earn a master of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Judaic Studies with a special section dedicated to the Catholic Jewish dialogue. That was the first news. The second, since last year already, the long time existing collaboration between the Colonel Bear Center and the Center for the Study of Christianity at the Hebrew University whose director, 
Dr. Bruriash Galoni is with us here to our great joy tonight. This collaboration has been amplified and corroborated by the exchange of a visiting teacher in addition to the annual visiting professor, like Professor Yuval tonight. So at present, Professor Pino Di Lucio from the Pontifical Biblical Institute is teaching a class at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's teaching it in modern Hebrew to students registered to the program of the Center for the Study of Christianity. The Cardinal Bea Center was able to offer a course on rabbinical literature taught by Yakir Paz from the Hebrew University in April and May of last semester and will host a forthcoming spring semester Amit Vayahu from the Hebrew University to teach a course on the significance of Jewish law in Jewish history. And now it is my great honor to introduce tonight's lecturer, Professor Israel Yuval. Israel Jacob Yuval is Professor of Jewish History and Academic Director of the Interdisciplinary Research Center on Skolion Jewish Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His academic work engages in particular with the mutual perception of Jews and Christians in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And the immense bibliography of Professor Duval testifies this particular interest. In other words, he is simply the ideal candidate for the Brenningmeyer Wehrhahn lecture. And one may indeed start wondering why it has taken so long, why it has taken 12 annual lectures before, before we would have him here tonight. <laughs> Let me try to give you one answer just now. Tonight is lecture number 13, and for the patrologist's ears, with the number 13, the number 12 plus 1, we are entering the sub-apostolic, the after-apostolic era, the era following immediately the era of those writings still in, in immediate connection with the apostles. It is the period of the second century, the period of the battle of the determination of the Christian canon, especially the battle as how to understand an abiding meaning of the Old Testament in the light of Jesus Christ for Christians. And at the same time, it is the period of the configuration of rabbinic Judaism the way we encounter Judaism today. As in some ways, no better number for tonight's lecture of Professor Yuval than that this number 12 plus 1, number 13, did rabbinic Judaism emerge out of Christianity. Yesterday, Professor Yuval, in a seminar session with the students of the Cardinal Bea Center, said when he was younger, maybe much younger than he is now, still young, he was considered a provocateur, someone who loved to run up with his thesis run up against established academic certainties. Now, said Israel Yuval yesterday, he has become sort of part of the establishment. <laughs> well, some very excited emails from Seattle in the United States, from Washington DC, some places in Italy, written by persons who absolutely would like to receive the link to the video that portrays Professor Yuval's lecture tonight which the Cardinal Bea Center indeed will put out on his, uh, its website, is telling me that tonight's lecture is still perceived to be stimulating, if not provocative. Ladies and gentlemen, to you, Professor Israel Yuval. Mrs. Brenningmeyer, Mr. Father, the rector, Professor Dumortier, dear friend, Professor Philip Lenches, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> On the back of my Hebrew book, entitled Two Nations on Your Womb, Percep Perceptions of Jews and Christians in the Middle Ages, I wrote the following sentence. I quote, the Christian polemic against Judaism ended after the Holocaust and the establishment of the State of Israel. This book is a product of this post-polemical era in which one can publicly publish what once was customary to whisper in private." End quote. 
In all the reviews written about my book, this sentence is the most frequently quoted, usually from a position of disagreement. And yet I still believe that we are living in a new era in which Christians and Jews can calmly observe the history of these two sister religions from a perspective of mutual understanding. Such an observation is not necessarily easy and each side also finds it internally difficult to re-evaluate oneself. This lecture, more than it comes to tell you something new about Christianity, is an attempt to re-evaluate Judaism, that which evolved alongside Christianity. Many Jews won't like, perhaps, what I have to say, although my thoughts are actually induced by deep appreciation to the Jewish faith and its efforts to survive. I'm deeply excited to come from Jerusalem to, to Rome to talk to you about the relations between Christianity and Judaism, and this is the first time that I do that. This is a personal closure in my academic biography. My scholarly journey in this field began 20 years ago on German land as a student of the Middle Ages who worked also on religious, religious persecutions in the era my encounter with modern and post-Holocaust Germany was a turning point in my endeavor to understand the complexity of Christian-Jewish relations in history. From there, I returned back to the land of Israel to look at the origins of this shared and painful journey. Now, I arrived at Rome to close this circle and present to you my current perspective the fruit of 20 years of research. It is a special pleasure and honor for me to do so in such a, in such a special evening in the presence of Mrs. Brenningmeier Verhan, a great lover her and her, of her and her husband of Christianity and Judaism, who are both making every effort to prove that what I have wrote in my book is indeed true and that Christian polemic against Judaism had in fact ended. Many scholars in Jewish studies and in Christian theology regard Judaism as the mother religion and Christianity as the daughter religion. This is also an old model which defines the relations between the two religions. It can find some support in the famous parable of Paul I quote, if the root is holy, so are the branches. For Paul, the root is Abraham and the patriarchs as founders of the Jewish people. If they were holy, so should the branches be of their descendants. But then Paul continues and introduced the new believers, believers in Jesus using again the metaphor of the tree. And I quote the famous location in Rome, if some of the branches have been broken off and you, thou a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. The wild olive has been engrafted into the fruitful one when the old tree began to decay. And this caused the decaying olive to revive, to flourish, and to have new branches. The conversion of the Gentiles to Christianity was understood by Paul as the grafting in of wild branches into the good old olive, which is the synagogue. But the Gentiles ought to beware of every kind of pride or ambition. Indeed, in many visual representations from the Middle Ages, the two religions are depicted as trees, but, <clears throat> but mostly as two distinct trees. In the Liber Floridus, written in 1120, the synagogue is depicted as a dry tree called Arba Malor, whereas the church is the Arba Bona. Joachim de Fiori preserved the Pauline one tree description. The tree his tree is divided into <clears throat> two branches stemming from Shem and Japheth. The branch of Shem, 
the Jews will flourish until the sun will be revealed. Then we'll start a new era in which the Yafet branch, the Christians, will be filled with flowers and the Shem branch will become dry. At the end times, both branches will converge in a wonderful, colorful blossom. And this painting actually lies on the wall of my office in Jerusalem. These representations help to implement, to implant the mother and daughter religions metaphor. History, too. After all, Judaism was older than Christianity. Therefore, when the Esau, Jacob brotherhood became a metonymy among Christians, Esau naturally represented the old tree, the synagogue, whereas the younger brother, Jacob, was identified with Christianity just the opposite of the Jewish metonymy. I would like to offer today a corrective. I would like to claim that the origin of some basic new religious ideas in rabbinic Judaism, I stress rabbinic Judaism, not the biblical Judaism, can be related to Christianity. My purpose is not to claim that Judaism quite simply imitated Christianity, quite the opposite. My claim is that the challenge posed by Christianity motivated the rabbis of the Mishnah and Talmud to create counter institutions. The unique creativity of rabbinic Judaism in a rural and small population in the constrained space of the Galilee between the third and the fifth centuries is the result of the blurred borders between the two religions. Moreover, in contrast to the situation in the first century, when the Jewish temple religion was still strong and dominant, the situation in later centuries quickly changed the balance between the two religions. Judaism was gradually marginalized, while Christianity became the successful and soon the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. Jews lost their ability to decide the religious agenda and were obliged to respond to an external growing threat. Not only did the Jews become a minority, they also suffered from what could be described as a cognitive gap between the glory of the past and the miserable state of the present. This, to my mind, explains the unwillingness of the sages to admit that Christianity became a problem for them. Most of the Talmudic and Midrashic sources are silent about Christianity. This silence does not reflect indifference to, towards Christianity, but rather an attempt to con consciously ignore it. Whereas the articulated discourse ignored Christianity, the hidden transcript fought against it. Only rarely do we get a glimpse of the hidden agenda. The scholars of the Talmud were then familiar with early Christianity. How did they respond to its challenges? Whereas Christianity tried to deprive the Jews of their Bible and of their identity as the true Israel, the rabbinic response was to create a new Judaism that could hold its own truth against the new monotheistic religion. Some new Christian ideas were integrated into Judaism, while others were, so to speak, Judaized. The new rabbinic Judaism grew out of the ruins of the destroyed temple, as well as from the triumph of the new religion of the Christians. The rabbinic religion is an effort to cope with the question of who is a Jew and what is Judaism, including the counter definition of who is not a Jew. The Mishnah is the first post-biblical book which systematically avoids the use of the term Jew and instead uses always the term Israel. By using solely the term Israel, the editors of the Mishnah seem to cope with Paul and with the denial of their identity of Israel by early Christians. Correspondingly, 
the Mishnah is the first book to use the term, well known today, Goy, as indicating a non-Jew. The biblical word Goy meant a people, a folk, including the people of Israel. But the Mishnah wanted to create among Jews a new sense of ethnic identity by drawing semantic lines between the true Israel, who is a Jew and only a Jew, and all other people who have got the new name Goy. However, self-definition is a lengthy and open process that is based not only on rejection, but also on the acquisition of ideas, religious rights, and symbols from the competitive surroundings. In the following, I would like to give a few examples of new rabbinic religious ideas whose origins can be traced back to early Christianity. I will concentrate on three important examples, or four. The creation of a new sacred text, the organization of sacred time, and the ideology of atonement and salvation in rabbinic Judaism. Let us start with the creation of the sacred text. According to the belief of the rabbis, a second Torah, the oral one, was given to Moses at Mount Sinai together with a written Torah, Torah she'ba'al peh, Torah she'bichtav. This second Torah has been orally transmitted from generation to generation, and its study should also be conducted only orally. It was forbidden to write down the so-called oral Torah. One wonders what stands behind this new oral ideology. It is common knowledge in culture studies and anthropology that the general course in the development of societies is from orality to textuality. The rabbis had behind them a long tradition of textual culture as manifested in the Bible and in Second Temple literature. Why did they decide to move, so to speak, backward by adopting orality as an ideological command? The explanation I offer is that the emergence of Christianity, which is heavily oriented toward texts, caused the rabbis to adopt new marks of distinction. For centuries, monotheism had sufficed to distinguish Israel from its pagan surroundings. But the emergence of Christianity as a second monotheistic religion reshuffled the cards. Not only did it nullify the monotheistic uniqueness of Judaism, but it also adopted the biblical text as its own and included them within its own sacred scriptures. In this manner, the need was born among the Jews, to create an additional sign of separation, one that would clarify, distinguish them, them from Christians. Christianity defined itself by means of an alternative text, by the New Testament, and the Jews responded by creating their own alternative text, the Mishnah, and thereafter the two Talmuds, the Palestinian and the Babylonian. In a, in a similar and parallel move, the two religions both set up a new identifying, uh, identity defining text. Judith Liu emphasized the textuality of the Christian canon as formative in establishing identity. And in a parallel manner, one may point towards the orality of the old Torah as formative in establishing the rabbinic identity and distinguishing it from its environment. It ought to be emphasized that more than the rabbinic oral text reflects the concrete historical reality, it fashions it. The oral text is not only the result of a given historical reality, but it also plays a role in creating a distinct community, one with an identified internal discourse different from that customary in its surroundings. One is speaking here of an ideological decision formulated in an explicit way, and I quote now from the Talmud. 
Those things that are written, you are not allowed to say orally. Those things which are said orally, you are not allowed to say in writing. And this is only one statement out of many. The question stands out even more stri strikingly when examined against the background of the Greek or Roman pagan and Christian environment. The sages operated in a cultural environment marked by a prolific textual activity. Despite this, and notwithstanding the old Jewish tradition of writing during the Second Temple period, they insisted upon the prohibition of writing. As a result, their creation is anonymous and collective and is not crystallized around a single subject, but always around a former text, the Midrash around the Bible and the Talmud around the Mishnah. It is true that they inherited this orality from the Pharisees who used it as a method of transmitting knowledge and of learning. That is to say, it had a purely pedagogic function. But among the sages, orality assumed an ideological function in their struggle with the adoption of the written Torah by Christianity. This challenge is not simply an external point of friction, far away from the battlefront between the two competing religions, but rather an element that fashions and shapes the core, the substantive contents of the Jewish religious creation. The study of the oral Torah and not of the written Torah <clears throat> became the great religious principle from that point on and until today because it alone defined Jewish uniqueness in comparison to Christianity. I move now to the concept of sacred time or times or festivals. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem deprived Judaism from its sacred place and left it only with its sacred time. The need to reorganize sacred time was, was joined by the need to confront the interpretations given to biblical festivals by Christians. Thus, the Seder evening is closely related to the Last Supper. Contrary to the common understanding, I wish to claim that the Last Supper is not an adaption of the Seder, but rather the opposite. The Seder is a later Jewish response to the Christian Easter. Until the destruction of the Second Temple, the main ritual of the Jewish Passover was the sacrifice of the Lamb on the 14th day of Nisan, of the Jewish month of Nisan, and its consumption in Jerusalem during the night of 15th Nisan. This night was later given the name Seder night. The gospel traditions differ on whether Jesus' Last Supper took place on the eve of Passover, as in the synoptics, or an evening before, as in John. In the Christian liturgy, the synoptic version has been accepted, <clears throat> and the evening between Monday, Monday Thursday, <clears throat> and Good Friday is considered the evening of the Last Supper. Only after the destruction of the second temple, as no more sacrifice could be offered, a replacement for it developed among the Jews. The reciting of the Haggadah is this replacement. The Haggadah of Passover is a liturgical text that has evolved over the course of centuries, ranging from the second century of the Christian era till the Middle Ages. The last pieces, two German folk songs, were added in the 15th century in order to keep the children awake. In the first century, the text of the Haggadah was still open, but its main concern was already stated, I quote, the more one talks about the exodus from Egypt, the better. The replacement of the sacrifice by a narrative on the exodus from Egypt had far-reaching consequences for the character of the celebration. As long as the temple existed, it is not likely that pilgrims arrived to Jerusalem with their entire families. 
The majority of the pilgrims were probably young men. Jesus' Last Supper with his 12 apostles is a typical meal of young people who consume together the sacrifice in Jerusalem. The shift in the celebration of Passover from a sacrifice in the temple to the reciting of the Haggadah changed also its location. Instead of one celebration in Jerusalem, this celebration dispersed now throughout the whole world. The Seder, thus, the Seder night thus became a pronounced fa family celebration, at the center of which stood the children in order to make them familiar with the tradition. In Western Christianity, Easter is considered also as an ideal time for converts to baptize. Similarly, the Seder evening became a family celebration whose main aim is to teach and tell the narrative of Exodus, the foundation story of Jewish faith to children. The importance that the Mishnah attributes to the education of the children during the Seder shows its importance as a foundational right in which the identity of the community is constituted. As Jews began to tell a story in order to replace the sacrifice, Christians did the same. However, their stories were different. The story that the Jews told was about the exodus from Egypt, whereas Christians told the story of Jesus' passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. The earliest Christian source which describes the celebration of Easter is from the second century. The apocryphal Epistola Apostolorum from the middle of the second century reports how the group of the apostles told the story of the passion the whole night until early in the morning when the cock crows. An amazingly similar episode can be found in the Passover Haggadah. Five scholars from the beginning of the second century sat together and told the story of the, of the exodus from Egypt until dawn. According to the Mishnah, the Exodus story begins, I quote, begins with shame and ending with praise, goes from the negative to the positive. The structure corresponds, this structure corresponds to the story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Both stories are about salvation, redemption, and both had a comforting effect. Among the Jews after the destruction of the temple and the exile, among the Christians in time of persecution. We can speak of two parallel ceremonies with competitive stories. In order to realize how close Jews and Christians faced each other at the time of the formation of the two stories, it must be remembered that Christian communities in the East, especially in Asia Minor, Syria, and Palestine, did not keep the Easter on the first Sunday after the spring equinox day as usual in the West, but on the 14th day, Quartodecimus of the Jewish month of Nisan. This is why they were called the Quartodecimani. In doing so, these communities celebrated Easter in the original date of Jesus' crucifixion, according to the Jewish calendar. We must keep this historic background in mind. On the night of 14th Nisan, Christians and Jews sat, perhaps not together, but side by side, to celebrate the same feast of the same origin, but with different pasts and different memories. Both communities celebrated it by giving their own feast a meaning that they denied from the rival community. This dialogue and polemical relationships sheds new light and on the opening formula of the Haggadah. The householder takes a matzah in his hand and declares, this is the bread of poverty, which our fathers have eaten in Egypt. Every needy come and eat. This is a declaration at the opening of the evening. The saying is said in Aramaic, which was, 
the lingua franca in the eastern part of the Roman Empire until the Arab con conquest. The Aramaic language and the position of this declaration at the beginning <coughs> of the Haggadah give it the effect of a declaration of intent and put it in contrast to another famous opening formula <coughs> of Matzah, which ascribes to it a different meaning. Hoc est enim corpus meu. This is my body. Accordingly, the Jewish formula of this is the bread of poverty is the counterpart to the words of institution at the Last Supper, where Jesus says, according to John 6, 51, this bread is my body. Or according to Luke 22, this is my body given for you. Eat this in memory of me. So there is also an invitation to share and to eat. This requirement to remember the event is fulfilled both ritually by the sacrament of the host and textually by the narratives of the Gospels. In Matthew 26, the formula also contains an invitation to dinner. Eat, take and eat, this is my body, which resonates in the Jewish formula and every needy come and eat. According to the Jewish interpretation, the bread of poverty, the matzah, recalls the suffering of Jesus. According to the Jewish view, it is reminiscent of the bondage in Egypt. This is only one example out of many, which consists as a whole a much wider phenomenon. The Haggadah was created as a response and as an alternative to the Christian salvation story of crucifixion and resurrection. Both stories are based on the model of an exodus from darkness to light, mi chashecha leora, and from slavery to freedom, mi shiabud legeula, as formulated in the Haggadah and in the Peri Pascha of Melito of Sardis, a bishop from the second century whose sermon on Easter was discovered in the middle of the 20th centuries. Jews and Christians both agree that the story of the Exodus from Egypt is a typological model for a future redemption, with the difference being that for the Christians, salvation has already occurred, while the Jews are still waiting for it. In this regard, we can perhaps say that the earliest Passover Haggadah are the Gospels. The Jewish later Haggadah for Passover would be a Jewish response or, thank you, counter narrative to the Christian passion narrative. Let us now turn from Passover to Shavuot, the feast of weeks, and from Easter to Pentecost. The rabbi's festival of Shavuot commemorating the reception of the Torah echoes the festival of Pentecost, commemorating the descent of the Holy Spirit on the followers of Jesus on the 50th day after crucifixion. That is the foundation of the church and the making of the new covenant. The meaning of Shavuot as a commemoration of the revelation of the Torah on Mount Sinai was only developed after the destruction of the second temple. The Torah does not mention a specific date in which Moses climbed on Mount Sinai, and it does not hint to any connection between Shavuot festival and the revelation of the Torah. Only in the Book of Jubilees from the second century BCE, <coughs> we find the idea that the Shavuot festival was the date of the renewal of the covenant with Israel. The renewed covenant in Sinai continued the earlier covenants with Noah and Abraham. Even according to this interpretation, the Shavuot festival has no unique connection with the revelation of the Torah. The interpretation of the Book of Jubilees is probably the root of the later famous description in Acts 2 of the descent of the Holy Spirit 50 days after the resurrection. 
This event was regarded by early Christians as the founding of the church and the establishment of a new covenant between God and the believers in Jesus, who are considered the spiritual Israel. It is against this background that one must understand the rabbi's choice to turn Shavuot into a festival for the epiphany of the one and only Torah, the Torah of Moses. This statement was a rebuttal of Pentecost in turning the revelation at Sinai from its original meaning as a unique event that happened in the sphere of mythical history into a recurring annual ritual and liturgical event, the rabbis made a declaration. The Torah of Moses is unique and cannot be replaced by any other covenant. In contrast to the Christian claim that the descent of the Holy Spirit in Zion replaced the Old Testament, this new rabbinic interpretation declared the eternity of the covenant of Sinai. It is worthy to note that not only the new interpretations of these two biblical festivals have interesting parallels in the two religions, but also the new organization of the sacred time before and after Pesach, Easter, has surprising parallels in both religions, sometimes conflicting and sometimes not. The 40 days of Lent were for Christians a fasting season which prepared them to Easter. The preparation reached their peak during the Holy Week, which commemorates the last week of Jesus. For Jews, 45 days before Pesach began a period of great joy. Mishenichnas Adar, Marbim Besimcha. When Adar begins, a joy, the joy is increasing, with Purim in its myth. A period of 30 days before Pesach was allocated for the study of the halachot for Pesach. These preparations reached their peak in the last week before Pesach, starting with Shabbat Hagadol, a kind of parallel to Palm Sunday. Such conflicting, conflicting parallels... Did I say something wrong? This is a voice from heaven, from heaven, sorry. <laughs> Such conflicting parallels, the third covenant. Such conflicting parallels continue also in the period after Pesach and Easter. For Christians, the Easter season between Easter and Pentecost is a time of joy and celebrations of Jesus' resurrection. After all, it is spring. For Jews, this period of time called Sfirata Omer, is of semi-mourning. Allow me to quote in this respect the famous Jewish author of the early 20th century, Mendele Mochers Forim, who begins his book of beggars with the following description. I quote, as the warm wind begins to blow and the hot days arrive, it was written in Poland, and the entire creation is jubilant days of grief, fasting, and mourning are heralded by the Jews from the counting of the Omer, which is in spring, till the beginning of rain, which is the end of summer." End quote. <clears throat> I wish to discuss now another case of conflicting interpretations of two festivals, a Jewish one and a Christian, which fall almost also on the same days, Hanukkah and Christmas. As I will try to postulate later, we have good reasons to believe that Christmas saved Hanukkah from being forgotten <laughs> by filling it with new meanings. Let me first open by a few observations concerning Hanukkah in the first centuries. The discussion devoted to Hanukkah in the Babylonian Talmud opens with the famous question, what is Hanukkah? One gets the impression that the, that the significance of this holiday, holiday was no longer altogether clear in the first centuries CE. The answer given by the Talmud is no less perplexing than the question. 
we would have expected the Talmud to tell about the rebellion that broke out in Judea in the year 167 BCE in wake of the prohibitions imposed by the Greek King Antiochus Epiphanes on the performance of the commandments of the Jewish religion. We would also have expected the Talmud to tell us something about the military successes of the Maccabees in, conquesting, in conquering Jerusalem from the Hellenizers and renewing the service in the temple. But instead, the Talmud relates the story of the miracle of the vial of oil, a nice legend about how the wicked Greeks, Greeks contaminated all the oil in the temple. And when the Maccabees sought to renew the service in the temple and light the menorah, the seven branch uh, uh, candle, candelabrum, they found only a single vial for a single day while they required eight days in order to produce new oil. A miracle occurred, and the oil in this single vial sufficed for eight days. And this is the explanation why we light candles in the menorah. To jam the great military victories of the Maccabees into a small vial of oil seemed to modern historians as a sign that the sages of the Talmud had forgotten the political accomplishments of the Maccabees. There are even those who claim that they were not only forgotten, but erased from memory. That is, that the sages did not want to remember the history of the Maccabees, because it became, a century later, a corrupt state in which the most important positions were bought for money, and in which the priests serving in the temple had become a wealthy <coughs> aristocratic class alienated from the people whose culture had become progressively distant from the ideals of its founders. Indeed, an important historical study by the historian, Israeli historian Gedaliahu Alon of the Hebrew University, written around the 1940s, bore the title, Did the Nation Forget the Hasmoneans? I would like to argue that the fact that the Talmud asks, what is Hanukkah, need not surprise us as the question is not whether the sages of the Talmud forgot Hanukkah, but why they remembered it at all. From a poorly logical viewpoint, Hanukkah should have been long forgotten. Let us imagine a terrible reality, at least for me, that the state of Israel is destroyed and ceases to exist. Imagine a community if, of Israeli refugees in Rome 20 years after the destruction of the state. Is it conceivable, conceivable that they would continue to celebrate the day of independence of the state of Israel? In the year 70, Jerusalem and its temple were destroyed. What point is there in celebrating the rededication of a temple that no longer existed? It would appear that this scenario is not a hypothetical one. There is a short text from the period of the Second Temple entitled Megillat Ta'anit, the Scroll of Fasts, listing all those days throughout the course of the year on which it is forbidden to fast. Most of these are related to the history of the Second Temple, its successes and accomplishments, including Hanukkah. But after the destruction of the temple, Second Temple, all of these holidays were abolished, as there was no point in celebrating the successes of a state which no longer existed. Why was it then that all the other holidays of the Second Temple period were forgotten while Hanukkah survived? And indeed, there are signs that after the destruction of the Second Temple, Hanukkah was beginning to be forgotten. The Mishnah, edited at the beginning of the third century, devotes entire tractates to the various holidays, Shabbat, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Passover, all of them biblical holidays, but even to Purim, a holiday from the second temple period. But Hanukkah did not merit a Mishnahic tractate of its own. The fact that it nevertheless survived suggest that there may have been additional aspects to this holiday 
that continued to exist and that prevented its disappearance. The most striking additional feature of this festival is its connection to light. Josephus, the Jewish historian of the destruction of Jerusalem, refers to it as the festival of lights. He explains that salvation came to the Jews suddenly as the light, like light, banishing the darkness. Similarly, the Talmudic Hag Agadah legend concerning the miracle of the vial of oil emphasizes the motif of the menorah and the light, as does also the obligation to light candles. This connection between Hanukkah and light is alluded in the following beautiful Talmudic legend of Avodah Zarah. I quote, after Adam was created, and according to Talmudic belief, Talmudic view, the world was created on Rosh Hashanah, which is around September, the end of summer. So after Adam was created, he noticed that the days were getting shorter and shorter, and the light was getting progressively weaker and dimmer. Hence he was filled with dread that the world is returning to darkness and chaos and began to fast for eight days until the shortest day of the year. Once he saw that the days were becoming longer and the light was increasing, he made the next eight days into festival days. The next year, he made both these two cycles of eight days into festival days. He, Adam, established them for the worship of God. This was his intention. But they, the pagans, according to the Talmud, established them for the worships of idols. This last sentence of the Talmud clearly refers to two Roman, Roman festival days, Saturnalia and Calendis. Saturnalia is celebrated on the 17th of December and Calendus on the 1st of January. According to the Roman calendar, the 25th of December was the day of the solstice, the shortest day of the year. Now, between the 17th of December and the 25th, there are eight days during which the light becomes continues to become progressively weaker. Whereas between 25th of December and the 1st of January, there are again eight days during which the light increases. So we have these two cycles of eight days. During the third or fourth century, the 25th of December was marked in Rome as a holiday of the birth of Sol Invictus, the in Vincible son, God. But the Talmud still does not mention any Roman holiday on this day. It, and it, is, it also make no, makes no explicit connection between Saturnalia and Calendus and Hanukkah. However, the fact that the Talmud points out that Adam fasted for eight days and made a feast of for eight days and that he made them later into holidays alluded to the, a parallel between Hanukkah and one of the two units of eight days, either before the 25th of December or after it. A connection between Hanukkah and the shortest day of the year is indeed very plausible. It begins, Hanukkah begins on the 25th of Kislev, the Hebrew month, the natural Hebrew equivalent to the 25th of December. It also occurs when darkness, darkness is in, at its height, the shortest day of the year, as well as during the closing days of the Hebrew lunar month, when the light of the moon waves and then completely disappears. Yet another aspect that may indicate a relationship between Hanukkah and the shortest day of the solar year is found in the debate between the school of Shammai and of Hillel regarding the manner of lighting candles. The Shammaites think that one ought to light 
eight candles on the first day of Hanukkah and then reduce the number on each successive day. While the Hillelites hold that on the first day one lights one candle, adding an additional cal candle each successive night until <clears throat> one lights eight candles on the eighth night, and this is the custom that is practiced today. Now, the Shemaites approach may be seen as parallel to the first unit of eight days in the pagan system between December 17 and the 25th, during which the light gradually becomes dimmer, whereas that of the Hillelites neatly parallels the second unit of time in the pagan system between the 25th of December and the 1st of January when the light gradually becomes brighter. Where is Christianity here? Now it comes. During the first, fourth century, Christianity came to dominate the Roman Empire. The festival of the sun god on 25th of December was replaced by Christmas, and Jesus replaced Sol Invictus. According to Matthew, when Jesus was born, a star appeared above Bethlehem, symbolizing the light brought into the world by Jesus, also called by the evangelist John the light of the world. The statement, which has no source in the New Testament, as you, sure, as you surely know, that Jesus was born on the 25th December, created a relationship between this Christian story of the birth of the Messiah and the shortest day of the year. Thus, the renewal of light as an experience of nature received a mythic expression in both religions. Just as Hanukkah signifies the rededication of the temple, so does Christmas signify the birth of the Redeemer, who is considered in the Gospel of John as the new temple in heaven and whose crucifixion as an ultimate sacrifice, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, that atones the sins of his believers, just as the temple in Jerusalem atones the sins for the Jews. We thus have three focuses of light. For the Romans, the sun god, for the Christians, Jesus, and for the Jews, the temple and its menorah, all relate more or less to the same date, the 25th of December, the 25th of Kislev. In all three religions, the Roman pagan, the Christian, and the Jewish, the natural event receives a religious meaning. These parallels may explain why Hanukkah did not disappear and was not forgotten. In the fourth century, Hanukkah was needed in order to confront not so much the Roman feast of light, but the Christian figure of Jesus as Messiah. And indeed, we begin to find at that time messianic new elements in Hanukkah as well. The candles serve not only to commemorate the miracle of the vial of oil or the victory of the Hasmoneans, but also or rather a symbol of the Messiah and the future redemption of Israel. The lights of Hanukkah become the lights of the Messiah. Taking the word Christos in its literal sense, meaning Messiah, we can speak about a Christianization of Hanukkah, a suitable Jewish answer, answer to Christmas. To mention one example out of many, in the familiar liturgical hymn sung during Hanukkah Ma'osur, the final stanza is entirely devoted to the anticipated messianic redemption. I quote, uncover your holy arm and bring close the final redemption, end quote. Thus, the light of nature is transformed in both religions into the light of the redeemer. By adopting the motif of light, it became necessary for the introducers of Christmas to overcome the similarity between the pagan celebration of the birth of Sol Invictus 
and the birth of Jesus, both celebrations of light. In a sermon from around the year 380 on the holy lights, Gregory of Nazianzus writes the following, I quote, again my Jesus, and again a mystery, a mystery, not deceitful, not disorderly like that of the pagans, no belonging to Greek error or drunkenness, for so I call their solemnities of the pagans, but a mystery lofty and divine, and a light to the glory above. For the holy day of lights to which we have come, and which we are celebrating today, has for its origin the baptism of my Christ, the true light that lightens every man that comes into the world. This is a quotation from Joan. And he continues with another quotation from Joan. And I am the light of the world. Therefore, approach him and be enlightened, being signed with the true light. It is a season of, of new birth. Let us be born again. And the last sentence, do the Greeks, he means the pagans, who celebrate the Sol Invictus, celebrate any such thing in their mysteries, every ceremony and mystery of which of me is nonsense, and a dark invention of demons, demons, and a figment of an unhappy mind, aided by time and hidden by fable? We sense here a very strong effort to set borders between the Christian holy mystery and the mysteries of the Greeks, the Roman pagans. Both have light. Both celebrate the birth of a god in the solstice. This proximity is dangerous, and the difference is minimal. The only way to claim uniqueness is by labeling the other as profane, demonic, and to regard one's own light as sacred. A similar development can be observed in the rabbinic halacha. A liturgical poem for Hanukkah states, Hanerot halalu kodesh hen. These lights are sacred, the lights of the candles of Hanukkah, and we are not permitted to make use of them. Why are we not allowed to use the light of Hanukkah candles? After all, Shabbat is a more sacred day. The lighting of its candles is dealt in a special chapter in the Mishnah but it is not considered sacred, and we are even required to enjoy its light. How come that the candles of Hanukkah became more sacred than the candles of Shabbat? My suggestion is that the rabbis adopt the same tactic of the Christians. They felt obliged lehavdil ben kodesh lechol, to make a distinction between the sacred and the profane. However, it is not the pagan light that disturbed them. As we have seen, the Talmud was not troubled by heathens who turned the Aden festivals to pagan light. It is the Christian surroundings it, and its use of light as a symbol for the birth of the Son of God that blurred the uniqueness of their Hanukkah light. The Jewish light had to become sacred, or to use the Greek term used by Gregory of Nazianzus, it had to become a mystery. Determining that Hanukkah candles are, ca are sacred raises yet another question. Holiness is a metaphysical concept and its source should be divine. But the obligation to light Hanukkah candles is not God's commandment, but is rabbinic. Under what basis could the rabbis define their human regulations is holy? That question was discussed in great length in the Midrash. It called Midrash Psikta Rabbati. It begins with the following statement. I quote, no one should say that he will not obey the elders' prohibition 
to use Hanukkah's candles for unholy purposes because such commandments are not to be found in the Torah. To a man who does say such a thing, the Holy One, blessed be he, replies, No, my son, whatever laws the elders decree for you, obey. End quote. To solidify that claim, the Midrash co quotes a famous Midrash, according to which, and now we go back to the concept of oral law, according to which the oral Torah assumed a crucial function in the struggle with the adoption of the written Torah by Christianity. The oral Torah is depicted as mystery between God and Israel, with whom the Christians have no share. I quote, Moses, when he received the Torah, according to the Midrash, asked God that the Mishnah also be written, be written. Like the Torah, why to keep it all? Give me also the old Torah in a written version. But God foresaw that the nations would get to translate the Torah and reading it, say in Greek. <laughs> and they would declare, we are the children of, uh, sorry, we are Israel. We are the children of the Lord. And Israel would declare, no, we are the children of the Lord. And the scales would appear to be balanced between both claims. Who is Verus Israel? This is my addition. But then God will say to the nations, I continue the quotations, what are you claiming? That you are my children? I have no way of knowing other than that my child is the one who possesses my mysterium, my secret law. And the nation will ask, of course, nations here are the Christians, will ask, and what is your secret law, mysterium? And God will reply, it is the Mishnah. This Midrash clearly expresses the hidden conflict of Hanukkah with Christmas in which the commandment to light candles become a mysterium between God and Israel. It also demonstrates the true context of the ideology with which we started the lecture of the orality of the rabbis. The status of the holy candles reflect the authority of the rabbis and of the entire old Torah. The claim is made that the authority of the sages is derived from God. Just as the old Torah has been given to Moses at Mount, Mount Sinai, sorry, so too the future commandment of the sages receive their consent of God, and even he himself must obey to them. This is what makes the difference between the nations, the Christians, who read the Torah, the Bible in Greek, and Israel. While Gregory of Nazianzus used the term mystery to distinguish between Christian, between Christmas light and the pagan's light, for the Midrash, the holiness of the candles and the mystery of the oral law distinguish Judaism from Christianity and from its sac sacraments. The light of the candles is a reenactment of the light of the oral law. Both are facing the challenge of the light of Christ. Hanukkah's light was declared sacred because it has been raised as a torch against Christmas light. And by that I come to the third and last point, atonement and salvation. And this will be much shorter. I would like now to turn to the third axis in which I discover religious concepts in rabbinic Judaism which were, so to say, born from Christianity uh, and were finally integrated into Jewish self-understanding and authentic Jewish ideas. This third axis is characterized by a series of connections and religious ideas that revolve around a suffering Messiah, a Messiah who will die and rise again, a human sacrifice whose death will atone 
for sins. I will begin with the figure of Isaac in the rabbinic literature of the first centuries of the Christian era. We find in it a new version of the biblical story of the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. I mean the rabbinic version, the rabbinic interpretation is a new interpretation of the biblical story. Even the traditional name of the story as we call it today or as the Talmud call it the binding of Isaac, Akedat Yitzchak, shift the weight of this biblical narrative from Abraham to Isaac. The main hero in the biblical narrative is Abraham, who was tested by God. Whereas among the sages of the Talmud, and even more so in the Middle Ages, it is Isaac who becomes the central figure. According to some rabbinic traditions, Abraham opposed the command of God to do any harm to the boy and slaughtered him on the altar whereupon Isaac is risen from the dead. The researchers argue whether this tradition has Jewish pre-Christian roots or not. I tend to see it as a reaction to the crucifixion of Jesus in which Isaac is a kind of alternative Jewish Jesus. Even if this legend has been an ancient pre-Christian Jewish tradition, which I think is unlikely, it is obvious that it received a new meaning when it came into contact with the Christian environment where Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection formed the core of the Christian message. In my opinion, the Jewish interpretation of the so-called binding of Isaac is a Jewish appropriation, so to speak, of the crucifixion narrative. <clears throat> In addition to the adherence of Jesus among Jews, there were also then also a Jewish kind of Jewish Jesus envy, if we may call it like that. Shalom Spiegel, He's pointed out, he's the first one who elaborated and presented this weird, strange legend about Abraham slaughtering Isaac. He has pointed out the important function of these rabbinic interpretations in the world of Jewish martyrs at the time of the pogroms during the First Crusade in Germany in 1096. Those Jews, martyrs, were looking for biblical models in order to justify their behavior. In contrast to the biblical Abraham, the Jewish martyrs actually killed their sons and daughters in order to prevent them from falling into the hands of the crusaders and to be forced to baptize. In a time when the crusaders praised the idea of imitatio Christi, of the imitation of Christ, the Jews could not be satisfied with the story of the sacrifice of Isaac in which God at the last moment prevented the offering of the sacrifice. They wanted a full sacrifice as Christians have it. In the liturgy of the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the binding of Isaac plays a crucial role in the conviction of God to forgive sins. The idea that the single sacrifice of Isaac will atone for the sins of all future generations is completely absent in the biblical narrative and is a creation of the Talmudic post-Christian world. In my view, it is impossible to understand this new complex language without thinking of the relationship to Christianity, which has produced it and raised a strong desire <clears throat> for a Jewish story of, of atonement parallel to the Christian story of atonement by Jesus' crucifixion. I would like to conclude my presentation with an impressive representation of a suffering Messiah in rabbinical Jew literature. According to some rabbinic traditions, in the future, two messianic figures will appear, and not just one Messiah. The first is called Messiah, son of Joseph. The second, Messiah, son of David. According to the tradition in a book called Sefer Zerubbabel, which is a Jewish apocalypse from the 7th century, the first Messiah, son of Joseph, 
will participate in the eschatological war against Gog and Magog and will fall in the battle. He will die. Then the Messiah, son of David, will appear, defeat Armelius, and bring the Messiah, son of Joseph, back from the dead. In another Midrashic compilation from the 7th century, Pesikta Rabati, again the same one quoted before, the Messiah, son of Joseph, will suffer great pain before his death. I quote, Iron beans will be brought and loaded upon his neck. This is a description. The suffering Messiah, son of Joseph, is quoting Psalms 22. My mouth is dried like a pot shared. Words that remind us Jesus' thirst on the cross. Psalms 22 is interpreted in Christian exegesis as a typological description of the crucifixion of Jesus, quoting God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, which is taken from Psalms 22. In the Midrash, the suffering Messiah is addressing God, asking him, I quote, master of the universe, how much can my strength endure? How much can my spirit endure? Am I not flesh and blood? In my view, this Jewish Messiah, son of Joseph, who will be killed and will be rise again, is a Jewish internalization of the figure of the Christian Messiah, also son of Joseph. I come to the conclusions. My presentation focused on two, uh, three to four central concepts in rabbinic Judaism the creation of the oral Torah, the oral law, and the ideology to transmit it only orally, the new meaning given to Pesach, Shavuot, and Hanukkah, the sacrifice of Isaac as atonement, and the image of the suffering Messiah. Some of these religious concepts have pre-Christian origins. However, they change their meaning drastically in order to meet the Christian challenge. The Old Torah versus the New Testament, Passover versus Easter, Shavuot versus Pentecost, Hanukkah versus Christmas. The very central messianic drama of atonement and salvation incorporate Christian elements. By claiming this, I would not say that the entire world of Talmudic Judaism evolved from the search for an alternative viewpoint to Christianity. Jews have rules regarding segregation. The, Christmas, the Christians do not. Christian Catholicism has a hierarchical church, which never existed in Judaism. It is not my intention to argue about who existed first and who influenced, influenced whom, what is original and what is not. For the present relations between Jews and Christians, it is important to understand that history has placed the two religions together, like twin sisters that affect each other. Christianity is not only a religion that persecuted Jews, but it also had a significant share in the shaping of Judaism, even in times of tension and confrontation. The most prolific and creative period in the history of the Jewish people, that of the Mishnah and Talmud, is the result of this encounter. In, in the eyes of former generation, this, this encounter was very much associated with pain and humiliation. From our present point of view, it was also a fruitful event. The examples discussed here justify the assertion that Christianity had an important impact on the formation of new sacred rabbinic texts on Jewish religious festivals and on the history of salvation in Judaism. Therefore, we can summarize and formulate a final statement. Had there been no poll, there would have been no Rabbi Akiva. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Professor Yuval. I think at one level or another, we all caught the, let me call it the in, inversive or the even transformative power of what we just heard. And I think we all have also a sense of gratitude for the level of trust we have reached, not only to, to uh, think what we heard and uh, maybe read it, but to say it, to um, hear it, and uh, to speak about it in, in such a context like ours here in Rome. So thank you very much indeed. And I hope, um, I'm sure, that these inspiring words now stimulate a lot of questions. I'll, I would like to give us something like um, a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes for, for the platea, yes. <clears throat> Many thanks for the, the lecture. Uh, fascinating issues, provocative and well-founded uh, answers. I had just a question about the first issue, uh, oral and uh, written law. I, I guess you'll agree that the oral Torah goes back upstream Christianity in the old Pharisaic tradition. I mean, we have uh, we have narratives about Jesus uh, in a machloket, in a, a dialogue and controversy with uh, Sadducees, where he sides, just as Paul will do later, he sides with the Pharisees about resurrection. Because the Pharisees were able to read between the lines of the Torah. So between the lines, and not only the lines, not only the written Torah, but oral tradition. That was the first question. The second is, um, how to explain in the Talmud the relative openness of rabbis, of some chazal, toward the translation of the written Torah, in Greek especially, not only because, I guess, of the Greek, the, the Jewish Greek diaspora, but also because Greek is Greek. It's, uh, the language of Yefet is Yafa, the same. Uh, and at the same time, emphasize the, the oral Torah as a siag, uh, leave not to, to build an edge around the Torah. How to explain this uh, paradox? First, <clears throat> your two questions, first of all, concerning the fact that we have traces of morality which are <clears throat> pre rabbinic. Uh, I emphasized, of course, the Pharisees had already a transmission of orality as a source of their language. But they never related back to Moses. They speak about the tradition of the fathers. Something that comes orally and related to the ancestors. They don't claim that those laws were given together with the covenant. In other words, orality is not ideological among the Pharisees. So the two points that I mentioned, or that I stressed, is first of all, the, the turning of orality into ideology. You are not allowed to write down what you, you, you received from your fathers or, for, or your, from your ancestors. And perhaps the, the second, not less important point is what I would call the creation of a new Torah, the canonization of the Mishnah. And if you look at the Mishnah also in terms of style, and you, 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 it is a completely singular uh, uh, book which is different, completely uh, unique in its uh, uh, nature. And the admiration, the veneration even, of this canonization of a so-called second Torah. Of course, you relate it to the, back to the Mount of Sinai and, and, and claims that there were no a second revelation is something completely new. And this is where I see the difference between the, what I would call perhaps the pedagogic approach of the Pharisees and what turned to be much more ideological. Now, concerning the translation, you are perfectly correct. There is some, some kind of um, different voices among the sages. Some praise the translation of the Torah 
and this goes back also to the epistle of Aristeas, which uh, said it was all done with the consent of, of God. But still, what uh, is, this goes perhaps back to a tradition in which Jews encountered Hellenism and uh, could feel satisfied with the idea that the Torah becomes universal. But when you go back, uh, uh, when you continue, and you see also the very negative approaches to, to the translation of the Torah. For instance, there is, uh, first of all, a, a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, description of a catastrophe that happened, that it was a huge earthquake when the Torah was translated into Greek. So it was regarded also as a very a crucial and a catastrophe that occurred with, of course, with the later consequences. So I would say at the beginning, at first, the translation into Greek was considered as perhaps something internal Jew, which also uh, uh, touches or is related to Hellenized, to Jews who needed the Greek version of the, of the Torah because they didn't know Hebrew. But then later on, it got more and more negative aspects so that I mentioned here uh, Megillah Ta'anid, the scroll of feast. There is a medieval, a different scroll of feast which uh, mention the uh, 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 ninth day of Tevet is a day of uh, feast, of, uh, that of uh, uh, fast, because this is the day in which the Torah was translated. So it became a day of a huge catastrophe. So I, I would say that perhaps the early attitude is positive, and then with the knowing the results of uh, the adoption of the Torah and of the Bible by Christians, it became more and more negative. My question is, in, in your research, the Jewish heretics within the Jewish community, the Menim, were they the followers of that adoption of Greek Torah and development of Gnosticism, or were they the Jews who were following the teachings of Jesus? Well, allow me not to answer this very complica compl complicated question. Who are the Menim? This is a great debate in research. Uh, uh, to some extent, in, in many cases, it is very plausible to assume that the minim, the, what we call in English the heretics, are indeed Christians, uh, especially if I think about, uh, and we mentioned it yesterday in our work workshop, when we think about the so-called benediction, the minim benediction, which in fact is not a benediction at all, but a curse, uh, which is said in the prayer, in the Amidah prayer, in which the minim are cursed, probably these are Jewish Christians. And the, the, the meaning, the, it makes sense that the, the whole purpose of this kind of curse is to uh, uh, eliminate, to expel them, to exclude them from the community. But to claim that every time in which minim are mentioned in the Midrash and Talmud are only the Christian and not Gnostics or any other group, this is something that is beyond my claim and I would not uh, would like to make such an argument. Thank you so much for your conference and in particular for the second part because uh, I was discussing with my students at the Sapienza University of Rome uh, three hours ago about the uh, Jewish origins of uh, uh, some festivals <laughs> in uh, Christianity, and you have reversed the, all <laughs> what they said. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, um, I agree with you that uh, we cannot use uh, the later Jewish uh, documentation about festivals to explain uh, Christian festivals. And so I, um, I agree with you that uh, there are some, uh, uh, some sources that, that should be used uh, according to their uh, own dates. Um, my only problem about uh, what you have said about the possible dependence of uh, uh, the significance of the meaning of feasts, of a Jewish feasts, for example, uh, Hanukkah and the other, from uh, uh, their Christian uh, um, uh, cousins, uh, uh, is the following. In, uh, in Christianity, we have an evolution of uh, those feasts uh, and the different dates for each feast. For example, we have not lent before the fourth century. Uh, we, ha we don't have, uh, as you said, uh, um, Christmas before the fourth century. 
we have uh, Passover in the second uh, and the third century with different meanings and different uh, uh, uses in uh, Alexandria or in, uh, in other parts, uh, in, uh, in other regions. When do you date uh, this great effort made uh, by the um, intellectuals who made uh, this effort? Uh, because uh, uh, it is after the fourth century or before or during and taking into account the single development of uh, Christian festivals. Thank you. But this is the, of course, the uh, most delicate and problematic question of dating. It goes both sides. Since when is Hanukkah what I meant, I described as a messianic festival? It's certainly after the fourth century, not before. Uh, and I would say the same about the development of, of the Seder evening, the text. Uh, I mentioned here as an example, and this was only just an example, the, the opening, the declaration in the beginning of the Seder e evening, this, this is the, bro the bread of uh, poverty, of affliction. Come and eat. We don't have any, uh, 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 by the way, the similarity after I remember, after I thought about this parallel be with the uh, Hocus Enim Corpus Meo, uh, to my, it was very unfortunate to see that uh, already Jacob Scaliger uh, uh, made the same uh, uh, parallel, but he, of course, was of the opinion that when Jesus said, Hocus enim, he was imitating and took it from the Halachma, from the Jewish. But the fact is, the textual fact is, that we know nothing about this declaration of the explanation of the bread as a bread of affliction of the story of Exodus before the ninth century. Now, I do not claim that it started in the ninth century because we don't have liturgical text from earlier, but it is not attested in the Talmud. So we have good reasons to believe that this declaration, which is a very important one, is later, comes much later, certainly later than the, 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 the New Testament. And I think that I, I paid a lot of attention to the question of, uh, of exactly dating. And sometimes it is difficult to date. You don't know. And you don't know because let's take the prayer book, the Jewish prayer book. The earliest Jewish prayer book that we have today is from the 10th century. It doesn't mean that Jews didn't pray before, but we don't have texts. So we can, we can perhaps uh, make some uh, suggestions about the dating of, of uh, earlier prayers, but I think basically in, mo in, in most or in all the cases that I bring as proof for my argument, uh, we don't have any reason to believe that the Jewish parallel is pre-Christian. This is crucially the most important claim, otherwise it all falls down. So I cannot go now into details, but this is uh, more or less, I mean, not more or less, this should be the case, uh, uh, and uh, I can elaborate if you want later on on a textual basis, but this is, of course, the, the crucial question. In your third point, you referred to the atonement and the new interpretation of the Akedat Yitzchak. Is there also a creative new uh, shape uh, of the Day of Atonement in Judaism uh, through the, the polemics and the dialogue uh, with Christianity? And the other way around, the feast of the elevation of the cross uh, in September we have in Christianity, especially in the Eastern Church, uh, is it related to the Day of Atonement? Well, this is a part of perhaps a future investigation. I would mention here, perhaps in that respect, the wonderful book of a friend of us, a colleague, Daniel Stöckel, who already wrote very much about parallels between Yom Kippur and Christian uh, Daniel Stöckel. Uh, uh, so uh, there are also some parallels with Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and I, in another paper uh, that I didn't pu publish yet, also the, um, there are interesting parallels between the inauguration of, um, of the uh, um, Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem and which is, uh, uh, and, and, and the inauguration of the first temple also in Sukkot according to the Bible. So these are further examples that can bring other aspects and other uh, um, 
cases in which we find parallel uh, uh, development or even more than that. I concentrated myself on the three main, I mean, the, these three festivals. First of all, because it's easy to, to bring in a public lecture, lecture and, and, and there are more or less now in my research already, I, I believe I reached a final point. In the other cases, it is still work to be done, work in process by, by others and also by me. I cooperated with Daniel uh, uh, last year and we are working together on, on other examples. I think they will also bring new demonstrations of these close relations between the, the creations of new meanings for the holy, for the sacred time. At this point, I would like to conclude the academic part of our evening here. Um, our exchange, our dialogue with Professor Yuval and among us may continue. Refreshments are served outside. Please look out for the kosher table. <laughs> Professor Yuval mentioned a certain Jesus envy. I know there's also a certain goyish kosher food envy, so um, <laughs> the, the table is open. Um, thank you very much, Professor Yuval. Thank you very much. For your